the hosts of the bookshelf, and I'm very excited to introduce both my co-host, Mark Soderstrom, an associate professor of liberal studies and work labor policy at SUNY Empire State College. I'm also excited to introduce our author today, Veronica Shainess, who is an American author of fantasy stories and associate professor in the Department of English at Queens College, CUNY. Um, I'd just like to share a quote uh, from one of the reviews. The tales Veronica Shainess tells are a heady brew. She blends radicalism and fairy tale, vengeance and punk and feminism with, with an angry, grieving surrealism. She is inevitable and essential by Roz Caveney. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I'd like to pass this to Veronica Shainess, who will be uh, gracing us with a reading from her story, uh, Baba Yaga, take, uh, Emma Goldman takes tea with Baba Yaga. So much. I'm so delighted to be here, and I just wanted to thank you for having me on. Um, this is a story that's in three sections, and I'm going to read briefly from the first, the opening section, which is um, a historically oriented section. One, history is a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a girl, the third and youngest daughter of a merchant, whose charms lay not in her looks, but in her brains and voice. But those brains lay fallow as her father was one of those who did not believe that knowledge was of any use to a girl. So she set out on a journey and she traveled far from home over land and over sea until she came to a strange land. Or perhaps you would prefer this. Emma Goldman came to Rochester, New York from St. Petersburg in 1885. She was 16 and she was very, very smart. Despite her intelligence, her misogynist father denied her an education and had even thrown her study books into the fire. Truth can be told in any number of ways. It's all a matter of emphasis, of voice. I have not lied about anything yet. And in this strange land, she met a young man, a young man who beguiled her with his ability in dancing and won her heart with his love of reading. But his promises of love and ecstasy were empty and the girl continued her travels. So she set her sights on a larger city in this strange land, a city booming with glory and misery and set off once again. She left behind the young man, bitter at the failure of his overtures and her eldest sister who felt for her a mother's love. Here are the same events told a different way. After a little over a year in Rochester, she was divorced from an impotent husband and barred from her family's home. Her parents had followed her to Rochester soon after her arrival for loose behavior. Only her older sister, Helena, who had long stood in place of a mother to Emma, supported her. So she packed a bag and headed to New York City. Well, where else? The fairy tale sounds better, I think, or at least different. It makes Emma's life romantic and mysterious, her emigration a grand adventure rather than an escape from the very real menace of rising anti-Semitism. As soon as I ground this girl as Emma Goldman, she is no longer on a mysterious quest. She's only waiting to become the fire-breathing anarchist. But the matter of fact history is much more succinct, a bit juicier in some ways too. Good for Goldman refusing to settle for a lifetime of sexual frustration. What a waste that would have been. Good for Helena too, the older sister who had supplanted Goldman's harsh, unhappy mother. The sister who loved her and consoled her and brought her up and stood by her steadfastly even as Goldman became a lightning rod for scandal and political persecution. Emma Goldman had long been interested in leftist politics and in New York City, she found anarchism. She had a vision of a humanity unfettered by the coercive violence of the state, cooperative societies without hierarchy. In some ways, collectivist anarchism is what Karl Marx envisioned as communism's ultimate goal, but anarchists know that the state will never wither away of its own accord. It must be abolished at once. In her youth, she believed in what was called propaganda of the deed fervently enough with her lover, Alexander Sasha Berkman, to plan and execute well, fumble, an attempt on the life of Henry Clay Frick. Frick was an anti-union Carnegie Steel factory manager responsible for the murders of nine striking workers. Berkman was to kill Frick and then himself and Goldman to explain his deeds and their motives afterward. Their hope was that Frick's murder would inspire a working class revolution that would overthrow capitalism. Needless to say, that is not what happened. Berkman got two shots from a pistol off at Frick, missed and was then tackled by a security guard. He nonetheless managed to stab Frick three times with a dagger before being clubbed on the head by a nearby carpenter. He attempted suicide, but was restrained and taken into custody. 
Berkman ended up serving 13 years in prison and one in a workhouse. He insisted he had acted alone and Goldman avoided prison in that instance. But with her fervent belief, her brilliant orations and her personal bravery and defiance, she rocketed to radical celebrity in the United States and Europe, speaking on anarchism, sexuality and art. She read, she wrote, she spoke, she published, she agitated. She ran afoul of the law more than once. She was no longer a girl. She grew stout, she grew white hairs. She still believed in free love and longed to practice it, but found fewer and fewer lovers. She continued traveling, speaking, and loving as best she could, even after the United States did its worst and deported her to Russia in the midst of its civil war, she continued. Emma Goldman found anarchism, and the rest, as they say, is history. It's all history now. Goldman has been dead and buried for almost 80 years, and Red Emma, the most dangerous woman in America, is safe for leftist Jewish feminists such as myself to lionize. She can't open her mouth to reject her elevation to sainthood. The greatest orator in America no longer speaks. She has become more icon than iconoclast. She is history. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, just the opening is, is moving. Um, the way the way in your writing that you mix sort of history and fairy tale and magic um, while engaging at times some really dark and very contemporary themes, um, depression, abuse, rage. Um, it, it makes your work sort of difficult to classify at times. How do you classify your work? Do you think of yourself as fabulation or uh, fantasy or speculative fiction? How do you how do you put your work in a box or not? Huh. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm teaching a course on genre theory, genre and genre theory this semester. Um, and my point of view as a writer is very different from how I approach it as a teacher or a scholar. For me, um, I think less about the work itself and more about my home in the writing community. And my home in the writing community is in fantasy and speculative fiction. Fantasy taken as a subset of speculative fiction. And that's where um, I found really supportive, a really supportive writing community where I found very supportive editors. Um, and where I found much of the writing I like to engage with as a reader. So I definitely think of myself as a fantasy writer, as a spec fic writer. Um, but it's it's less based on the text and more based on my experience of creating the text. Um, so I don't know if that really is a helpful answer to anyone but myself. It totally makes sense to me, right? Engaging, engaging. People ask me, what are you, a, if I say I'm a fan, people ask me, what are you a fan of? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> in a community of people who are fans together. We, we share an interest in speculative fiction, in science fiction, in fantasy. And, and I personally, I try to sidestep the genre debate mm -hmm. at, all, at all times. Even when I'm writing criticism, I've never found the genre arguments to be all that useful to me. So it's nice mm -hmm. to hear that you have sort of a similar experience of thinking of it as a community and a home, not a textual categorization. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, very yeah. thoughtful. Thank you. Textually, I've always liked Brian Atbury's formulation of genres as fuzzy sets, you know, with a center and then rather than as boxes and, and then points around it where you can be in relation to more than one center. Um, but, you know, that's that's only one way to think about it. Yeah. Well, following up on that question and, and thinking about how you engage the community, um, just like I guess also connecting the the story that you just read from, I, I loved the way that when Baba Yaga and even her cut become characters and interact with like the historical character of Emma Goldman in your story, it becomes so creepy and wonderful. Um, I also really love the way how you updated the story of the 12 dancing princesses, which before I read this book, I had never read. Um, and uh, into the 12 brothers trapped in a pump club or turn Sid and Nancy into a fairy tale. Um, in that community of, of authors beyond genre, as you just discussed, are there influences that you drew on to, to learn how to work with fairy tales in that way? And do you see those influences as political? 
Um, very much so. And I'm just going to pause here and say my son, my, my mother is just bringing my son home. So we may get a little bit of cute six-year-old disruption. I, I hope everyone will bear with me. Um, uh, writers who have been massively influenced, the two I always think of are Angela Carter and Kelly Link. Um, and I had the same feelings when I read them years apart for the first time, which was that I didn't know you could write like that. And it felt like it felt like the world expanding inside my head. Um, and I do see the use of fairy tale as political in very much the same way that Carter uh, writes, wrote about using fairy tales as political, where she, she wrote that fairy tales like pornography like to strip out context and pretend that they're universal and speak universal truths. And by putting historical context back in, you can expose how the, the power dynamics they represent as natural are actually historically contingent. Um, and she was speaking specifically of talking about issues of gender and sexuality. I think about it in terms of leftism and also um, Jewish history. Um, but I think that that's a very political act to denaturalize power dynamics that people often accept as natural. Um, and, and Carter really um, articulated for me why that's so important. Yeah, that, that's really striking. Um, the combination of sort of history and fairy tale. Um, I think at, at uh, the International Conference for the Fantastic and the Arts, you had mentioned that there were three themes that kept revisiting in your work. Um, and what you just said about sort of the way that history informs the context of fairy tale, I think really applies to uh, your out, you, the three things I think were Alice in Wonderland, punk, and the politics, the problem of the left. Um, <laughs> and, and it strikes me that, 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 that analysis of the way you bring history back into fairy tale to reveal the constructed nature of power is so plain in each of those categories, but striking in the Alice in Wonderland, which is such a naturalized, made innocent kind of tale, but has such a historically violent underpinning to it. Yes. Um, could you expand a little on those three themes and do you see them as sort of separate in your work or how do they come together in politically interesting ways? That's interesting. I, they definitely intersect in various stories. I know, for instance, we were talking about Serpents a few minutes ago is one that brings together punk rock and Alice in Wonderland, which feels like a natural intersection to me because... Um, not only is there the extraordinarily questionable issue of the story's genesis, but one of the things that made Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and still makes it such a powerful story is how angry Alice is throughout the story. Um, people remember it as being a whimsical and delightful story and it's all fairyland and la la la, but actually Alice's experience is one of mounting anger. And it's striking to me that in a context where little girls, women in general, but little girls in particular, were not allowed to express anger and negative emotions, she expresses her feelings quite strongly, right? From saying, this is the stupidest party I've ever been to, to finally getting angry enough to break out of this horrible world she's trapped in. Um, and that anger, of course, fuels um, so much of the great punk rock. And I think righteous anger fuels so much leftism as well. So perhaps what ties them all together is the sense of anger as a motivator, as a, as a, as a source of power um, and inspiration. Um, I don't think I've ever done a story that brings Alice together with the left. Maybe I should work on that. I'll have, I'll have to think about how to do that. <laughs> if, if I could, if I may, you mentioned earlier like the, the need to denaturalize power dynamics and all. And you also bring up this issue of, of righteous anger, and that's also characterized in the left when we want to challenge uh, current power dynamics and capital and all. How would you see in in fairy tales? Why is it important to denaturalize those power dynamics, and how does the role of of like righteous anger maybe play into that? So fairy tales are stories that um, I think many people uh, take for granted as being children's stories and therefore not important. Whereas I think it's just the opposite. They are children's stories and we don't, too often we don't look carefully at them and that makes them all the more important because they're sort of, we learn them so early in the West and they, they end up structuring 
um, our, our ways of thinking about the world. Um, and because of that, they end up, I think, being sites or nodes of, of a lot of, um, they're sort of load bearing structures for how we, how we think of um, the world is operating, right? And so an example of this is um, both Little Red Riding Hood and Bluebeard, right? Which traditionally are stories where the, um, pro the female protagonist who is uh, uh, the victim or the target of abuse in both of them is blamed in the traditional readings for her own uh, troubles, right? They're victim blaming stories and when you look at the morals, but when people like Angela Carter um, came to rewrite them, uh, they were able to uh, radically shift the point of view, the, the understanding so that it was understood that this was a symptom of patriarchy, right? And that's, I think, um, I like to work with fairy tales because of their familiarity to many people. Um, but I also like to work with unfamiliar fairy tales. Like I rewrote, uh, uh, I wrote a sequel to The Jew and the Thorn Bush, which nobody reads anymore, nor should they, because it is a horrible anti-Semitic tale. Um, and I think it's because they, they are deceptively simple, right? You take narratives that are, that people think of as being simple, as not needing explanation, not needing explication. Um, and then you can sort of blow them up um, by which I mean explode them, not blow them up into something bigger, although that too, but explode them. Um, and all of a sudden there's all this complexity inside. And I think, you know, when I talk about an explosion, that's where the anger comes in, right? I was angry when I wrote Among the Thorns. I was angry at the existence of the story of the Jew in the thorn bush. Um, I was angry when I wrote um, Ballroom Blitz about the 12 dancing princesses, because I thought it was such a horrible thing to do to those poor young women, right? Who were clearly had a quest of their own, a task of their own they were working on um, and were punished for it. Um, so I think the anger becomes the motivating force and the fairy tales become the vehicle, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I... I hope we come back to sort of I think I think in a way Alice and the left are connected through that feminist rage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean I think I think there's a feminist, a left materialist feminist rage in which I read Alice as your figure of Alice as a left figure in through that through those sort of materialist feminists. But um, in addition to the sort of mostly fairy tale oriented stories, you write deeply historical stories like the the Emma what you just read um, and you write about, you know, the Russian revolution, you write about the match girl strike, you write about the triangle shirtwaist factory fire. Um, what, what sort of draws you to those events? What makes an event interesting to you as something you want to write about? Um, what kind of research do you do? I teach, I teach students who want to write historical fiction. So I'm always looking for, uh, for, for, for help in how to counsel them. How do you approach your sort of history themes? That's interesting. Um, I'm very, very lucky in many ways. And one of those ways is my parents um, were in our leftists. My mother was a stay at home mother and she felt very strongly that it was uh, part of her, part, an important part of her mothering to bring me up with an awareness of leftist history um, and an understanding of leftist history. So in some ways, um, events like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire um, or, uh, as, or parts of the black, black freedom struggles in this country or the Russian revolution um, are stories that resonate to me in a very familiar way, the way that some fairy tales do. Not because they are fairy tales, but because I learned them very young and I grew up um, sort of surrounded by the concerns that they made material. Um, so in some ways, it's very natural to me to reach for those concerns and those events when I start to think about how the world is shaped and structured and how what intervention, what literary intervention I want to make in it. Um, at the same time, they're very real events. And one of the things that's really important to me in portraying real events is that um, you don't let people who do harm off the hook. 
So when I work with real events, it's very important to me, for instance, in um, with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, that the demon did not cause the fire. The demon did not lock the doors, right? Um, what the demon does is get a particular character a job there. Um, but the harm, the harm itself, right, is done by human beings, is done by capitalism, is done by capitalism's agents. Um, and that's that's a very important thing to me when I when I work with um, historical events. When I research them, um, the Match Women Strike is an interesting example because that was an event I did not know about until I started writing this story. It was uh, for an anthology of fantasy stories taking place in the Victorian era. And I had just about had it up to here with steampunk, um, which was my motive. There was my righteous anger. I'd had it up to here with steampunk. And I thought it was a terrible time to be alive. I mean, just as, this is a terrible time to be alive for most people on the planet, right? But it was a terrible time to be alive. Even if you had all the money in the world, you didn't have antibiotics, right? Like you didn't have vaccinations. It was a terrible time. And I wanted something that exemplified what a terrible time it was. Um, and I thought Fosse Jaw, I knew about Fosse Jaw. And so I started doing research on the match workers and the match workers, the match women's strike appeared. And I thought, well, this is, this is ideal for me. <laughs> this is exactly the kind of thing I'm interested in. Um, so I ordered, there's a book on it by Louise Raw called Striking a Light, um, which is a fantastic history, um, really wonderful. And I, or, and I had to order it from the UK. I don't think it was available in the US, but through the magic of the internet, I ordered it from the UK and read it and, um, it was amazing. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of deep dive research. Um, I really, I think you need to research about three times more than you ever put into the story, maybe 10 times more. Um, and then someone else can has to tell you to cut out all the parts that were too good to leave out, but don't aren't really relevant. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that would be my advice to your students. So always, always research more than you think you're going to need. I will pass that along. I try to tell them that too, but they don't take it from me. So every additional voice is good. Yes. And it's, I would always also say for writers to play to their strengths, you know, that like play to your interests. I didn't start learning about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire when I decided to write Burning Girls. I had long been interested in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire because I'm interested in the history of New York City. I had already done a huge percentage of the reading about the fire, at least, I had to do a year's worth of research on other aspects of Burning Girls. Um, but especially if you're writing historical fiction that requires research, make sure it's something you're interested in and want to read a lot about. <laughs> you know, on that topic of the research and, and the passion that goes into it, and also still thinking about like the rage and harms that we're actually trying to, to engage when we do this research and all, I kind of want to ask, like, how can we actually connect or, or compare issues of like the real harms that are caused today when we think of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and the fact that we still see that in present day Bangladesh now, mm -hmm. um, and and across like like where manufacturing has been exported to, but also the invented harms of like right wing anger and the invented mm -hmm. harms around like how can we teach our kids critical race theory when and things like that, like. How maybe, how maybe can we address that when we also think about the research that goes into these stories and, and I don't know, either telling them apart or understanding the different characters of it? Interesting. Um, I think that, you know, all rage is not created equal. Um, and certainly white supremacy feeds off um, a type of undirected rage, or I shouldn't say undirected, a type of very directed rage as well. And as you say, manufactures excuses for the rage, right? Um, critical race theory or, or, or some such nonsense, right? When really the, the rage is a response to um, a fear of loss of power, right? In that case, in my opinion. Um, there's a fear of loss of control over the dominant narratives about American history. Um, uh, and that, that, that is a real fear because that is certainly what I am hoping to do, seize control, you know, take control of those narratives away from white supremacists. Um, I think that speaks to how important narratives can be, uh, that, it, that it 
cause it that it is you that it generates such a huge reaction um, on the part of right wingers. I think that is one of the reasons why I try to research my historical fiction very carefully because you want to base your rage in in facts in truth if it doesn't sound too um, uh, uh, idealistic that it's not just that first graders are not getting taught critical race theory because that's a that's a that's a graduate level legal theory. It's that what you mean by critical race theory, i.e., the history of this country uh, as it as it relates to um, its oppression of Black Americans, genocide against Native peoples. Um, That history is, is is true history, right? Those are facts. Um, and when if you if you are basing your rage in something you can't identify, like most people can't talk about, can't most people who are opposed to critical race theory can't really define it, um, and are just sort of um, upset about the existence of these facts. trying to articulate this, you need to be able to to under to to base your rage in truth in, in facts, in truth, in history, in what actually happens, not in what you fear will happen, if that makes sense. I don't, I'm not sure I was making a whole lot of sense toward the end of that. I was trying to articulate something and it was a little inchoate. I, I think you're saying we need to base historical stories like grounding them in actual history. And that somehow is actually really important to say. <laughs> As a historian, I can I can advocate for for actually <laughs> grounding historical stories in 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 good history. Um, I I I am I, I love that we've sort of come to this topic of rage. It was something I just revisit when I was looking over some stories this morning. Um, I I I was like rage. That's what I was forgetting to think about <laughs> earlier. Um, I love I love the house in your short story swimming right where the fiance is terrified of being eaten consumed by the house that is getting fat off of human flesh like Moloch in that yes. wonderful, in those wonderful words. I, um, and she's terrified sort of of the boyfriend's family that's so invested in this thing. And it really reminded me of um, Pamela Zoline's kind of infamous uh, heat death of the universe story, right? In which the woman's life is described as descending into chaos as the house is falling apart as the children need more care and she describes it in terms of the the second law of thermodynamics right and this is one of those sort of founding texts of what becomes feminist new wave and feminist speculative fiction um do you see yourself how do you see yourself participating in that tradition and do you see yourself as sort of politically updating some of those themes or continuing that tradition in any particular way it's interesting that you mentioned that story i wrote that story for my cousin who was engaged to um a man whose parents were engaged in building a a bizarre house that was only getting more and more bizarre as it was built um They've read it and they love the story, so it's all good. Um, but it felt to me, it seemed to me like an uh, an example of a sort of on the nose uh, materialization of theme of worries about domesticity, starting at a very young age. Right there's a whole bit with the tiny tears doll, where girls are trained to be uh, maternal and domestic. Um, I had that doll when I was a little girl, and so did my mother, and you know we that. I, I love that doll. It's not, you know, these are not necessarily bad things to teach your children how to care for younger creatures. Um, I think, I think we would benefit if boys got that, more boys got that training as well, to be sure. Um, but I guess I would hesitate to say anything as self, self-aggrandizing as I'm updating the tradition. I, 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 I don't feel uh, that I'm in a position to, to say that, but I would say that I would like to be 
continuing the tradition, as you say, of um, questioning what it means to make a domestic life, right? The story ends, spoiler, with her blowing the house up as she, but as she and her fiance are committing to each other, right? And it's a story that I think um, very much in the Emma Goldman tradition suggests you can have love without, without being immured um, in this house that will not stop growing, right? You shouldn't have to give up love in order to, um, in order to do that. So I think it's one of the most hopeful stories in the collection, actually. When stories tend to be bleak, that one ends happily. I guess in part, that's what I meant by updating, right? Is, is it actually has a happy ending. You get, she gets away in the end, right? And she gets away and she gets to still commit to this person, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Zoline's story is bleak. Mm -hmm. right? There is there is no there is no salvation at the end of Zoline's story or even mm -hmm. like Genevieve Valen, uh, Valentine's story, uh, Familiaris, where mm -hmm. the, she's eaten oh. by her children, right? It's yeah, that is amazing story. But as you link this to domesticity, I sort of have wondered if some of the influences in other stories as well are not mm -hmm. some of those materialists and revolutionary feminists like Selma James or Sylvia Federici in Wages for Housework or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the wonderfully evocative Shulamith Firestone, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if some of those theorists and, and thinkers have sort of influenced some of the ways you approach some of your themes, Alice in, you know, in particular. You know, um, it's interesting because one of the things I try very hard to do in some of these stories is to reclaim feminine coded labor and not just labor, but feminine coded activities as, as positive, right? Because it was one of the problems I had with Shulamith Firestone when I read her many years ago, um, that the phrasing that pregnancy is barbaric, labor hurts, right? That women cannot look for freedom and equality until, uh, and she wasn't using the word cis or trans, but cis women cannot look for freedom and equality um, unless uh, our bodies become like cis men's. Um, it locates the source of oppression in the cis female body. And that's another way of saying the cis female body is inadequate and inferior. And I've certainly heard that before, right? It's, that's been echoed down all through the eons of patriarchy. Um, and I don't think that's true. You know, I think it's, I think being able to create another person is an amazing, amazing achievement, right? Like, uh, that's brilliant. And I've done it and it does hurt. Absolutely. It's painful. Um, and I'm not saying that part is great, but it is still an amazing capacity to have. Um, and similarly, um, I think the rejection of the possibility of romantic love carries with me that sense of ew girl cooties. Right. That like that's the kind of thing that 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 girls or teenage girls like to read. I say that as somebody who is very bleak and grim about the real life possibilities of romantic love. But um, I think that the, but, but, but between swimming and ballroom blitz, which also ends as a rather more upbeat um, ending that I tend to give my stories. Well, that just says a lot about my stories because it's not a particularly upbeat ending. Um, suggests that uh, to me I'm trying to suggest that we can have those pleasures we can have feminine things um the source of 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 misogyny is not in femininity it's not in the cis female body it's not in feminine coded activities it's it's in it's in male oppression of you know ma cis male oppression of women um and other um non-cis male people um, so that's the sort of balancing act I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, work on. I've, I've always take, I've always liked Adrian Rich's reply to Firestone of women, of woman born. That was a very meaningful text to me for a very long time, not an unproblematic text, certainly, um, but a very meaningful one. Um, and that's sort of where I'm trying to enter into that tradition. Thank you. That's really thoughtful. I mean, Firestone is so provocative and so problematic at the same time, mm -hmm. right? That, yeah. that um, we, we 
or at least I find myself reading her to try to take particular things and leave some of her class politics just horrify me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but but um, to try to to try to reclaim some of some of what is positive and and forgotten Absolutely. there. Um, yes. Uh, so that's why I sort of link it to your work, but perhaps Federici, who, mm. who has a real positive value to sort of reproductive labor, mm -hmm. um, might be a might be a closer fit to the way you do some of your work. Um, she's stunning and expresses sort of what you have just expressed um, beautifully. And, uh, and thank you for that. That a lot to think about. Christine Delphi too, sorry. No, oh, please go ahead. I was thinking, I read Christine Delphi in graduate school about women's labor as well. And that's, that's somebody else who's always been an influence on me. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, Kira, you were. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just want to ask, like, touching upon that that issue of like the body and and this reproduction issue and all. In most of your stories, there's some really important and and every single historical one, an important like mother daughter mother uh, grandmother granddaughter bond that that kind of grounds the narrative or the first person perspective, mm -hmm. and. Um, I know a, a moment that definitely stuck out to me, like like in Serpents, the whole thing is, is about going to the grandmother's home. But then um, a moment that stuck out to me was when uh, Emma Goldman says to Baba Yaga, the revolution will be my child. Mm -hmm. What what draws you to engage so deeply with mothers and uh, and how that connects to the left politic that we kind of just brought up with with Silvia Federici and, um, and Firestone? Um, that's that's exactly what connects it, right? The reclamation of motherhood um, as a positive, right? There are so many cultural representations in the history of the West of mothers, particularly Jewish mothers, as being negative, right? As being, as being the source of domestic oppression, as being, you know, a pain in the neck, as being um, smothering, as being, you know, homicidal in fairy tales, as being. Um, uh, uh, um, what you have to break away from in order to find liberation, right? Um, at the same time, there's, there's this other ideal of the selfless, always self-abnegating mother. Um, and I, I think it's really important um, to not just humanize mothers, but humanize the mother-daughter relationship, right? And that comes out of, of woman born. It also comes out of... Um, the uh, some psycho some psychological theory I read as a graduate student the a relational self uh, from the Wellesley Stone Center theorists, um, as well as um, uh, you know uh, Nina Nina I can't remember her last name now Nina Lick um, I'll put it in the chat whose work has whose book has not been translated but his short article was translated um, about what it, about daughter mother daughter relationships and just to come back to Angela Carter in her book the Sadean woman where she analyzes um, pornography the Marquis de Sade representations of women she says that Sade's great imaginative failure was that he could not conceive of a mother who was also who also had sexual pleasure Right. And she ends that book by quoting Emma Goldman back at Saad. Right. Uh, Red Emma Speaks is the final uh, the final page, I think, of the Sade and Woman. And it's a long quote from Emma Goldman. And I don't have my copy on hand right now, so I can't read it to you. Um, but she basically she, what she is saying is we cannot be human until we can accept mothers as being fully human. Right. And that means neither demonized nor self uh, self sacrificing, but actual full human beings with um, um, uh, who are living full lives. Right. Until we can allow that to happen, until until mothers can have full lives, we have not achieved liberation. Right. Because otherwise we are we are achieving our liberation on the backs of um, of uncompensated female reproductive labor, um, among other things. Um, and so motherhood is important to me politically, but it's also important to me personally. My mother is amazing. Um, I, I am so lucky to have my mother um, and she has 
shaped my thinking and my writing in so many ways. Um, it, uh, it's just one of the most important relationships in my life. So it, I connect also on a personal level. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a wonderfully deep, deep answer. Thank you so much. I wish I could respond better to that. Um, now that we've approached, we've approached basically like the quarter mark here, um, we do want to open it up to q and I, I want to kind of maybe start it off with a, a very, um, so not their question, who are you reading nowadays? I am reading, actually, I've been reading a lot of fairy tales. So right now I'm reading this book from 1919 called Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. Um, it's, this edition is from 1952, but it was published in 1919. And I'm sort of reading it half as research for, you know, fairy tales and folkloric elements I want I might want to include in future stories, but half is because I like to read fairy tales, which is why I write them as well on a, on a, on a more um, basic level. So I'm reading a lot of fairy tales and legends lately. I also just read this amazing thriller um, by Alyssa Cole called When No One Is Watching about the gentrification of Brooklyn. Um, it's amazing. It's very um, grim and bleak. It's about um, a, a, a black woman who comes back to her neighborhood in Brooklyn after uh, a failed after her marriage dissolves, and finds that it's changing rapidly and sinisterly all around her. Um, and she become and her neighbors are disappearing, being replaced by 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 um, by hostile white yuppies. Um, and she's she begins to suspect and understand that there's something even more sinister than you might understand gentrification to be at work. It's so good. I also was just reading also on the theme of gentrification of my city, um, uh, The City We Became by N.K. Jemison, um, which I adore um, and uh, is also is about gentrification sort of figured as an inimical Lovecraftian hostile external force um, that the avatars of New York City have to come together to fight off. Um, and I I cannot, these two books are just amazing. So I know that they're, they're they, I, I am late to the party with both of them, but uh, it's a great party. Right. Thank you so much. I guess starting off the Q&A, we have two people who wrote questions in the chat. First is from Joe Ramsey asking us to maybe expand on um, the positive and negative aspects of Firestorm. Uh, I'd like to defer to Mark. It's been so long since I've read Firestorm. <laughs> um, I mean, Firestone is 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 a wonderful sort of feminist, early feminist engagement with sort of Marx and Freud together. Um, and when I picked her up, this is exactly what I needed um, many years ago. And and I I sort of immediately fell in love. And and the idea of of the way the way that she combines sort of uh, culture in cultured oppression and systemic oppression um are really liberating and positive and and the way that she creates a sort of technologically positive marx as opposed to a romantic backward looking marx the way that she along with haraway in certain ways thinks that feminism should look forward not backward to some kind of romance is really powerful. Um, at the same time, she was immensely young and she wrote this manifesta that uh, has deep problems when it comes to sort of patronizing aspects of class rhetoric, patronizing aspects of racial rhetoric and and sort of patronizing, even, even some ways patronizing, as you put it, toward to motherhood, right? Um, so there are some deep problems, but I think she sets a really wonderful sort of revolutionary groundwork that other people uh, will later build on. But then we tend to sweep her under the rug and forget about her um, along, you know, and, and she she forms sort of the base work for women like Marge Piercy, Woman on the Edge of Time. Right. And I can give a plug here on December 12th, Shelter and Solidarity is going to be hosting uh, Sophie Lewis, who will be speaking on feminism against the family. Um, and she has done a great deal of work with Firestone lately and also working with um, Colin Ty and some of the revolutionary feminists. And I'm very excited to be part of that. 
and I think it builds very nicely with with what you've just been talking about, Veronica. So I thank you for leading us to the show a month from now. I will tune in. It sounds like it's going to be great. All right. We do have another question uh, from the audience. Um, Jim, would you like to unmute and uh, say your question? Um, yeah. Um, we're talking about rage and, you know, historical um, events. What would be what's your view on the central of empathy in telling a story, but also the reader? Um, it may be seem obvious about a reader having empathy, but I guess it goes back to, you know, the old Bart, uh, Roland Barthes ideas of a writerly and readerly text. So, you know, what, what's the central role of empathy on the role of the reader and the author in telling those stories and engaging with that work? Interesting. I think empathy is um, so important. And it's in, I had just mentioned the Wellesley Stone Center theorists. They talk about the central role of empathy in constructing the self, right? Um, and so when you are constructing literally constructing other other people in the in the form of characters i think of course um empathy is a huge takes a huge uh takes it takes a huge is is a huge role there um as is um as it as it does when you read right because part of what writing is is manipulating the reader's empathy right who do you who, who do i want you to be whose feelings do i want you to be caring about in this story um at the same time um, because we live in a society that um, pressures us to have certain kinds of empathy, what Kate Mann calls sympathy, right? For, for men who commit violence against women or to default to think about white women as innocent, right? I think it's also important in a story to press back against that um, and to sometimes uh, try to thwart um, an automatic empathy that that perhaps is, act, is disguised unkindness to other characters or other people. Um, I don't think rage is incompatible with empathy, right? I think that, you know, many, as many leftists and activists as we all know, right, the, the rage can easily grow from empathy, right? When you see, when you see someone who is suffering who is not you, um, and you care about that suffering, right? Easily empathy transmutes into rage. Um, and I think that's a really important connection to hold on to. All right, um, we have two more questions in the Q&A. Uh, Juliana, do you want to unmute and read your question out? Let's see, am I here? Am I, un am I? Okay. Um, yes. Hi, Veronica. I really, I really enjoyed hearing your work, and I'm very interested to read it. I was wondering. I'm not actually looking at my question, but I hopefully I can remember it. Uh, it has to. I work a lot on the representation of activists in fiction, fiction across the board in you know novels, TV, and and uh, so on. In other words, the uh, not so much, uh, or as kind of a subcategory of, uh, with a socialist or, or a leftist bent or talking about social problems or issues, which is a fairly large uh, mm -hmm. universe, um, not as large as we might want it to be, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to the portrayal of actual people doing actual things, like even somebody like Emma Goldman may often be mentioned, or mm -hmm the organized, you know, the, the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire and so on, but the, but the people who, who are there on the ground doing, organizing and thinking and talking and or all of the stuff that, 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 that goes into it, which are fascinating dramas, his, you know, and, and adventures and all kinds. I mean, they have everything you could want in a story of any kind, but they're, they're rather rare uh, mm -hmm. to, say, to say the least. And then when they do come up, they're often 
the the portrayals are quite uh, stereotyped this type of negative, you know, kind of along the lines of what you were saying about about mothers, although again, it's a smaller universe, but, but very biased. Anyway, I was just interested to know, you know, uh, what your comments are on that. And if, as you, in your characters, if you if you actually, uh, uh, you know, you talk about Emma Goldman, maybe there are other, either uh, well known figures or people who are just, you know, there on the ground doing the things that we know activists and organizers are doing if they appear in your work. That's interesting. You know, I had never um, thought about that, but of course you're correct, obviously. I think it's so easy to make fun of people who care about things. And I think we have yeah. a culture that, that very much wants to do that, right? Because it, it gives an excuse for everybody else not to care that much and not to put out the effort. Um, but I was brought up to think of, leftist activists as heroes, mm -hmm. right? The people, yeah. people put their bodies yeah, on the too. line. <laughs> yeah, people put their bodies on the line in order to make a better world. Um, that's, that's heroism. Um, and so I think I sort of take that for granted when I write my stories um, that, uh, that, you know, the, that the strikers in the, match, in the match factory were heroes. That's what they, you know, and I was brought up to think that and I was brought uh, and I and I um, you know actively seek out cultural texts that that represent that like John Sayles texts made one um, and and things like that um, so I guess I don't consciously think about that I just sort of take it for granted which I realize is not a very satisfying answer so I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry All right, thank you for that. Um, we have another question who's gonna be closing out our um, thing. So we've actually had two questions so far from our uh, different co-producers from the Shelter and Solidarity Group, uh, Joe Ramsey, and now we'll also be having uh, Linda Liu uh, closing us out from our Q&A. Linda, do you wanna unmute? Sure, hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about uh, popular cultural twists on fairy tales like Disney's um, blockbuster film Frozen mm -hmm. and uh, The Snow Queen, which um, is one of my childhood favorites, uh, seems really kind of dark and complex. And I'm wondering what you think of Disney's adaptation. I think the real problem with Disney is not necessarily what it does or doesn't do, but it's monolithic flattening out of other variants of tales, right? So that my students think of so the, real, the real Little Mermaid as the version Disney has. My students think of the real Snow White as Disney's Snow White. If their versions were one among many popular variants, well, fine, you know, why not? Um, their 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 saturation of the of conscious of the of the popular consciousness around fairy tales I think is deeply problematic. It, it wipes out local traditions. It wipes out um, uh, huge amounts of of variety. Um, Frozen itself, I mean, it's certainly leagues and leagues better than the Disney movies that were available when I was young, right? Um, and I enjoy it. Um, I don't think it's any, I mean, I realize it was originally based on the Snow Queen, but it is so far from the Snow Queen that I don't think it really has anything to do with it at this point. And I don't think of them as versions of the same story. Although I know, again, that's where it started. Um, I think, you know, if you are looking at popular children's adaptations of fairy tales, you can do worse than Frozen. Um, but it shouldn't be the only, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would hope it's not the only version of the only kind of fairy tale that that anyone is looking at. Um, I think it's a lot better than Maleficent, you know, speaking of contemporary Disney redos of fairy tales, I yes. thought Maleficent was a hot mess. Um, Definitely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, for the discussion and talking with us and entertaining questions and being very thoughtful and provocative. Uh, we are hoping that you are able to give us a short reading as we close our our program. Um, 
I would be I would be ha happy to. Thank you. I will. Uh, since wonderful. We, thank you. We've been talking a lot about phosphorus, the story about the match strike, the match workers strike. I will read uh, the opening section of that. Um, okay. A man can strike a Lucifer on anything, the wall, the bottom of a shoe, a bar stool. Sometimes the white head of the match will flare up from the friction of being packed at the factory and an entire box bursts into flames, releasing the rough poison of white phosphorus into the air. And the box goes on burning until the girl who was packing them stamps it out and then the Bryant and May match company finds her. London in the 19th century is marked inside and out by the black burnt trails left whenever a Lucifer is struck, a series of black marks scoring the city's face like scars. The Lucifer allows an easy way to kindle fires to provide light and heat and smoke without the unreliable and frustrating business of flint or the danger of congreves, matches prone to exploding into burning pieces upon being struck. And Lucifers are cheap, much cheaper than matches made from red phosphorus, which can be struck only on the side of the box anyway. Lucifers are so cheap that in the words of William Morris, the public buy twice what the, as much as they want and waste half. Herbert Spencer calls the Lucifer the greatest boon and blessing to come to mankind in the 19th century. The pathways the Bryant and May match women take home from the factory every night are marked by piles of phosphorescent vomit. It begins with a toothache, and those are not uncommon, not where you live, not when you live, not uncommon at all but you know what it means and you know what comes next, no matter how hard you try to put it out of your mind. For now, the important thing is to keep it from the foreman. And for a while you can. You can swallow the clawing pain in your mouth just as you swallow the blood from your tender gums along with your bread during the lunch break, if you have bread that day. A mist of droplets floats through the air, making the air hazy, hard to see through. They settle on your bread. Your teeth hurt, but you can keep that from the foreman. You can eat your bit of bread and keep that secret, but then your face begins to swell. Property is theft, wrote Karl Marx, and for almost 35 years, Karl Marx lived in London. Private property, he said, is the theft from the people of resources hitherto held in common, and then that property can be turned to capital, which can be used to extort labor from working men and women for far less than its value. Another theft, theft of communal resources, theft of labor, and for these women and girls, the matchmakers of the Bryant and May match factory at Bow, it could also become theft of bone, theft of flesh, and finally theft of life. Not that they don't put up a good fight. Fighting is something they're good at. Fighting, dancing, and drinking, those wild Irish girls of London's East End. That's what reformers and journalists say anyway. And I'll stop there as we're at one now. Okay, um, I just want to say thank you uh, so much for, for doing this reading, for coming on today. This was just so wonderful. Um, no, I guess, thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah. wonderful. Mark, do you have any final comments and all? No, thank you. Phosphorus is one of my favorite stories. It's what introduced me to your work. And I'm so, so happy and thankful for that story and the rest of the stories in your collection and really appreciate your time uh, with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's just been wonderful. And I, I'm definitely gonna tune into future, uh, future um, episodes because I wanna hear more of this from the other side. <laughs> We're really glad to hear that. Well, to continue with the thank yous, first, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, it was really great to have such a great Q&A as well as the engagement on the different aspects of the text. I'd like to thank my co-host here, Mark Soderstrom, for one, recommending me the book, insisting on, on we, need to, we need to talk about this book, and then finally lending me the book when it came time to, uh, in, in connecting us together and all. Um, I'd also like to thank the co-producers of this show from the Shelter and Solidarity Collective, uh, in order those Lena Durkin, Linda Liu, Sren Mudliar, Mark Soderstrom, Joe Ramsey, and Tim Sheard, and Rachel Eurasius Patton. Uh, I'd also like to thank, um, I'd like to, like to thank our co-sponsors, the Community Church of Boston, a free community of, for study and the practice of universal religion, Encuentro Cinco, a movement building project uh, in downtown Boston, Harbell Press, a publisher of working class writers, 
Socialism and Democracy, a journal that brings together the worlds of scholarship and activism, and uh, the Liberty Tree Foundation. Thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, I'd also like to sh give a shout out to the Shelter and Solidarity Show, which is our sibling show. It is a bi-monthly Thursday evening show, and you can find more on our website, shelterandsolidarity.org. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you again, Veronica, for, for joining us today.